Hello and welcome. Um, just to check that chat's working, um, please give me a thumbs up or a smiley face in chat. I'd love to hear, love to hear from you. Uh, while you're doing that, I'm Sarah Turner and I'm joined as usual by my Angel Academy co-founder, Simon Hopkins, and our network manager, Michelle. Um, and of course, our brilliant panel today. Um, this is going to be chaired by our very own Yiman Tum. Um, and on the panel, we'll be exploring the US VC landscape and US trends with our partners at Alumni Ventures. Um, as usual, now you found the chat, to talk to us and ask questions during the event, please carry on using the chat. Just a little bit about us first. Um, so Angel Academy exists to close the gender gap in startup investment as both the lack of investment going to female founders and the low number of women angel investing. We've been doing this since 2014. We've seen many thousands of pitch decks in our time and our members have invested in 51 businesses so far, many through multiple rounds. So we have more experience than anyone else in female investment in the UK. Do we still need to talk about gender? And this will be one of our questions for alumni ventures, but in our view, in the investment space, sadly, it's a resounding yes. 2% of VC funding went to all female founding teams last year, and angel investment declined by 40%. As female founded businesses tend to be earlier stage, they're more dependent on angel funding, so they were especially hard hit. So we've always been focused on action, not words. Um, as I mentioned, um, we've now hit the amazing milestone of 51 deals invested in through Angel Academy. Um, and alongside that, we've helped to mobilize well over 150 million pounds in co-investment. Many of our investments have a social purpose at the heart of their mission. Some of it around diversity, better healthcare, sustainability, or improved education. So they address many of the UN's sustainable development goals. Um, we're also one of Bohurst's most active angel networks and the only diversity focused network on their list. And importantly, we partner with both Innovate UK here in the UK and Alumni Ventures in the US. Um, and they, between them, deploy funds alongside us in many of our deals. Um, and we've completed two co-investments with Alumni Ventures so far, the first in Adora and also in Provenance very recently. We're very lucky to have some great sponsors supporting us with their professional expertise. They advise us and the founders that we back on deal terms, next stage investment and tax and accountancy. Um, if your company would love to get more involved, um, I'd love to hear from you. Please get in touch. Um, and we also have some mission aligned partnerships with women in telecoms and technology, women on board and PR firm Fieldhouse Associates um, and co-investment we've just mentioned and alumni ventures in particular, which brings me back to this evening's fun. We have a brilliant panel for you. There's plenty of time for your questions. So please, again, put them in chat as we go along. Um, and I'd now like to welcome Yi Man to the stage to introduce herself and her fellow panelists now. So over to you, Yi Man. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Hi, everybody. I'm Yi Man. Uh, I work on deals, um, partnerships, special projects um, with Sarah and Simon at Angel Academy. And we've got a lot to get through this evening. So I'm going to hand over to Ron and Brittany for them to introduce themselves and uh, the great work they're doing at Alumni Ventures. Um, again, like Sarah mentioned, feel free to put things in chat as you get prompted as you're listening and watching to them. And then we'll get to the questions after their presentation. Ron and Brittany, stage great, is yes. Thank you, Yiman, and thank you, Sarah. I appreciate the invitation. It's a pleasure and an honor to, to join you here today and to share a little bit more about Alumni Ventures and um, the uh, excellent partnership that we've already uh, started developing over the past uh, year or so. Um, so we'll 
maybe start with a quick personal introductions and, and then we can talk a little bit more about our firm. Um, so, um, so Ron Levin, managing partner here at Alumni Ventures, uh, responsible for two of our funds, our seed fund, which invests uh, at the pre-seed and seed stage and is uh, sector agnostic as far as uh, venture investing goes anyway, um, and also launching a new uh, specialized fund called the Doctors Innovate Fund, uh, which is a sector agnostic broad-based healthcare technology fund. Um, by background, I, I've been here about five years now, previously on our fund uh, that we call Yard Ventures, which uh, is a fund for the Harvard alumni community. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about um, our connections to university alumni networks uh, when we get to that in a moment. Um, but I was actually an investor in our fund before I came to work here. Um, so by background, uh, I had prior to uh, becoming an investor, was a, uh, a founder and operator. Um, so I co-founded a startup out of Barcelona called Travel Perk. Uh, it's an enterprise travel platform where I was a founding CEO, um, but left fairly early on uh, for personal family reasons uh, to move back to the States. Um, I, I left a little bit too early. The company has done very well. Uh, it's grown to over 1,200 people, um, including many of whom are, are based in the UK. Actually, there are a couple of offices in the UK, London and Edinburgh. Um, specifically, um, but it's it's actually a, a unicorn at this point. One of my co-founders is still there running the company today. Um, and um, uh, I had been in travel technology previously. I met my co-founders. We worked at Booking.com uh, together uh, over in Amsterdam. I, I spent about nine years cumulatively in Europe, in fact, um, just briefly in London, but spent more time in Amsterdam um, as well as Barcelona and, and earlier in, in my career, spent a little time in Madrid as well. Um, but uh, travel technology has kind of been an uh, interest of mine uh, for, for many years. Um, I had um, been also very interested in entrepreneurship and startups from a young age, um, started my first business at age 11, uh, studied entrepreneurship, both in undergrad at, at Babson College near Boston, and then later um, did my MBA at Harvard um, and uh, did some consulting and, and corporate and eventually knew that I would have to do a startup at some point. Um, but what I really love is, is entrepreneurship generally and, um, and being in venture capital allows me to speak with great entrepreneurs every day and hear about incredible innovation and, and new ideas. Um, so that, that's what I love about what I do over here. Um, but before I rattle on too much longer, um, let me turn it over to my uh, uh, terrific colleague, Brittany, to introduce herself. Well, cool. thanks, Ron. It's so great to be here today. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Brittany. I'm a senior associate here on the team. Um, like Ron, I'm kind of aligned across two funds. So I work for, uh, primarily for the Green D Ventures Fund, which focuses on our Dartmouth alumni community. Um, and then I also work on our specialized fund, which focuses on female founders, the Women's Fund, which is newly launched, um, which has been super exciting to work on both opportunities. Um, I think the one thing that kind of sets Green D apart uh, from the Women's Fund is we invest quite similarly to the seed fund across all different sectors, but we focus a little bit later stage as well. So we do Series A um, as well as growth stage investments alongside some seed as well. Um, and for women, for the Women's Fund, we focus primarily on, you guessed it, female entrepreneurs. So we back anyone um, in the seed to growth stage that is sort of founding um, with that background. Um, prior to joining AV, I worked similar to Ron, largely as an operator. Um, I was working mainly in the product space, working first at MasterCard, developing buy now, pay later, or installment solution products, and also scaling them to different fintech um, and banking customers globally. Um, and then later transitioned to the startup ecosystem, working with both early and growth stage companies in both product and operations and sort of anything that's required in startups. You kind of have to roll your sleeves up and be willing to do anything, but sort of did a full range of um, operational activities there. Um, and then really grew to love working with founders, um, even though I switched over to the investing side um, and super excited to be here today and share more about the work that we're doing. We can probably go to the next slide, I think. Great. Great. So I'll happy to share a little bit of an introduction on Alumni Ventures. So um, we are um, really the largest venture capital firm for individual uh, accredited investors. Um, we have over 10,000 investors uh, across many different funds that we operate within our group. Um, we're actually the most active venture capital firm broadly in the U.S., um, last two years running, uh, which is according to PitchBook statistics. So we're extremely active. Uh, we make hundreds of new investments every year, um, ranging from seed to growth. 
Um, and we were also recently ranked as one of the top 20 venture firms uh, by CB Insights, which reflects that we're not just about quantity, but also uh, quality of process and investment. Um, we've raised and uh, deployed about $1.3 billion in capital into over 1,300 companies at this point in our uh, eight or nine years or so of existence. Um, we're a team of uh, about uh, 40 investors backed up by around 90 others um, that support us um, in many different ways uh, across uh, six offices in the US. Uh, Brittany and I are both based in Boston, but we also have offices in New York, Chicago, Silicon Valley, Austin, and our corporate headquarters is actually Manchester, New Hampshire, uh, about an hour from us in Boston. Um, and you can see from this chart, um, sort of a little bit of our, our growth trajectory in terms of our portfolio. Uh, we can move to the next slide, please. Um, so I, as mentioned, I lead our seed fund. Um, we're um, very active as a fund. We make more than one new investment every week on average, uh, as well as doing follow-on investing. Uh, and we are basically, um, uh, the, sorry, this slide is maybe a little bit geared toward investors, um, but just to give you a sense um, that we do invest very broadly in terms of sectors and geographies, we certainly invest internationally. We'd actually like to do more international investing. Um, and uh, we, we also um, occasionally offer syndications. So um, we share with our investors uh, op individual opportunities in addition to the opportunity to invest in our individual funds. Um, it's a little bit of how our market uh, or how our um, model works, um, but we can move to the next slide. Um, so, you know, we, we often sell seed, and I think this is very similar for all of you who are involved with Angel Academy. Um, we think early stage investing offers the highest possibility of returns. Um, it's, it's certainly, um, you know, the riskiest moment and that the least has been, I guess, proven. Um, and yet the, the companies that do succeed can succeed in enormous ways, um, which is why we think it's important when you invest in seed companies to not just do one or two deals, but hopefully to invest in, in many deals, um, then you have greater chances of success. And, um, you know, the, the early stage at venture asset class does uh, outperform other forms of investing, which is why people do it. Obviously, it's not the most liquid form of investing, and sometimes it's hard to know when you might get a return on that. Um, but the, the returns that we do see as investors um, are quite attractive relative to other asset classes, and, th and that's why we do it, and that's why we're, we're believers in this seed investing model. Can continue. To talk a little bit about, um, this gets into how we formed a partnership with Angel Academy. Um, how we source our deals is, is any number of different ways, of course, um, but a lot of it really is through our, our network and through referrals. Um, and we developed uh, a little over a year ago something that we're, we call the Super Angel Partner Program, uh, where we form partnerships with active, experienced angel investors um, who refer deals to us. Um, that And we take a look at them uh, across many different sectors um, and uh, have the opportunity to tap into deals that we might not have otherwise known about or sourced on our own. Um, and that's certainly true in our partnership with Angel Academy, um, getting tapped into a couple of deals that, that we did not otherwise know about, but we found attractive and decided to participate in. Um, and last year alone, we actually completed about 35 investments that were sourced through our Super Angel partners. Um, Angel Academy is actually somewhat unique in that most of our partners are individual angels, um, but we wanted to partner with Angel Academy as a way to partner with an organization, um, particularly focusing on women entrepreneurs and, and, and entrepreneurs outside of the U.S. as well, um, as we're, we really want to have um, strong representation in our investing. Um, and uh, we got connected with Angel Academy, and we felt very aligned with their mission of the organization and decided to pursue a partnership that has so far been fruitful in two deals and hopefully more to come. Can continue, and I'll let Brittany take this one. Great, awesome. So, what is Alumni Ventures Women's Fund? So, um, kind of backing up a little bit and how the fund was actually formed because it only just started this year. Um, so, historically, AV has had a pretty long-standing commitment to female founders, and actually, since 2014, when we started, we've invested over 200 million across 350 companies into female founders and CEOs. So, we've done this work very often. Um, and data also showed us that oftentimes female founded businesses deliver higher revenues, have better performance over time, and often 
often have quicker exits. So considering all of these things, we decided to double down on our female founders and also grow our investments in two women, which grounded us out into a very similar fund to kind of what Ron just described, a diversified portfolio of venture-founded businesses only by women. Um, so since we are just starting the fund, our deals will be, or our portfolio will be a little bit smaller than the seed fund. So we're thinking of doing about 15 to 20 deals to start this year and deploying that capital over 12 to 18 months. Um, Similar to our other funds, this will be diversified across stage, sector, and geography. Um, and we will obviously seek to follow on with future rounds um, to sort of grow our percentage over time, especially for our winners. Um, but this is really an opportunity for us to continue growing our relationships with female founders and also continue to put capital behind these really great and impactful and also successful businesses as well. Um, you can go to the next slide. So this kind of highlights a little bit more of what I was just walking through. Like these are a lot of the stats that we sort of drew upon when sort of thinking about like, why would this fund be successful? And it really goes to the better performance. Research suggests that a lot of businesses founded by women deliver the higher revenues that I was speaking about before um, and often just times have better overall performance. Um, so that's a really great key driving factor for us wanting to continue to be behind these great companies. Um, quicker exits, oftentimes venture has pretty long exit life cycle, but oftentimes you're finding with female founders are either seeing acquisitions or um, IPOs or just general exits a lot quicker than other businesses as well. Um, and their range is quite large. So not only is this and, you know, femtech or women's healthcare, but also we're seeing deals in the software, pharma, biotech, healthcare, obviously, um, fintech spaces as well. So really great broad applicability of female founders really um, seeing great success. You can go to the next slide. And this is just a highlight of some of the deals that we've already done into female founders um, prior to launching the Women's Fund. Some of these are actually unicorns, the first being Kind Body, which is a fertility clinic network here in the US. Um, I don't believe they've expanded across the pond yet, but hopefully at some point they will, but essentially provides women really great access as they're looking to sort of build their families and sort of build out um, their um, fertility options as they're sort of thinking about that. Um, LVEST is a platform that sort of helps women invest their money. Oftentimes, women defer to their husbands to sort of do the investing on their behalf, but LVEST is really hoping to try to change that um, and give women the tools to make their own financial decisions. Um, and the last one I'll kind of highlight here is Carry First, which is a basically a gaming company founded by women. Um, they're located in Africa, but they're also incorporating a a fair amount of fintech into like payments of mobility and gaming as well, mobility and gaming as well. Um, and we have really great co-investors in all these deals that have really sort of been key driving factors for us, not only doing them, but also the fact that there's great female founders is just a bonus as well. And we can go to the next slide. Oh, actually, I think this is our last slide. Okay, very cool. Thank you for all the info. I feel like that's a lot to digest and stuff like that. Um, so basically, I was wondering if maybe you guys could talk about how things might flow from a DD perspective, given that generally speaking, you co-invest with partners and that's how you've managed to be ha have the momentum that like you basically have. Uh, like for, I remember with the Adora deal, you guys made a decision so very very quickly and we were really happy with that and the Adora team were really happy with that because of course it was like a stamp of approval from a really well respected US VC and that added even more confidence when we were building the deal out etc and then even with provenance like uh, when we introduced the deal to you initially it was part of the super angel program but you decided this was actually a much bigger deal than just for the angels and like you syndicated it across the uh, AV general fund, I think, or something. And then like it grew into a bigger check size than we had initially thought, which was really great. So yeah, maybe you can like tell us a little bit about how that works on the back end for you guys. Brittany, would you like to take on or? Yeah, sure. I'm happy to start and then feel free to add any color I may have missed, Ron. So um, I think a key part of our DD process is, goes back to our model. So we are a co-investor. So a lot of times we're looking to sort of understand the lead um, and sort of what kind of drove them to um, be the lead for the business and also potentially take a board seat. 
um, or just decide to invest in the business. So we rely a lot on that key diligence. I think in the case of Provenance, um, I think it was Mar Sir Martin Sorrell's fund that was sort of leading that investment. So for us, that's a really good sign that there's a really strong VC um, that has also an expertise in that space as well. I think that's another key piece of it as well, since we are generalist investors, seeing a lead that has a specialization in the sector, I think is also really attractive for us. So I think in the case of Provenance, that played really well. And then beyond that, we also obviously diligence the business ourselves. Um, and we, what we really look for is, you know, a strong market opportunity to understand that there could be venture size returns if, if we were to invest in the company. I think having a strong team, I think in the in the case of Provenance, for example, we saw that Jesse was a really well established entrepreneur and had done a lot of educational work um, in the, the field of specialty that she was sort of building in. Um, and also had a really strong founding team alongside her from a technical perspective or, or sales and go to market to sort of support her vision. Mm -hmm. um, I'd also say the product is really key. So we also look for things that are sort of differentiated on the market or or sort of get sort of giving something to the market that is not yet um, been fully met or has been underserved in terms of a need. Um, and I think those kind of all created a perfect storm to sort of allow us to kind of pull the trigger on that deal specifically. Um, but I think generally speaking, we're definitely looking for, you know, great lead investor with strong expertise in the deal, um, a strong market, strong team, strong product, um, and key business model as well, that we were, were, where we could see great scale and also just see those venture size returns at some point, because we do invest pretty early, um, but see those venture size returns at a, at a certain point. And does yeah. that scale have, oh, sorry, Ron, go for it. No, go ahead. Oh, does that scale have to be uh, into the U.S.? So not necessarily, right? I think there's, um, I think in the case of Provenance, they were just in the UK at the time we invested, but they did have plans to expand to the US market. So I think to Ron's point, we definitely have invested in businesses across the across the world. So we definitely have a preference for both, don't have a preference, I'm sorry, for markets that are in the US or the UK, but I think we are cognizant of big markets. So I think the UK and the US um, and certain markets in Latin America, for example, are like bigger markets than say, like some smaller company or smaller countries where we might not see the same profile. I think we, yeah, I, I think that was really well said, Brittany, and, and we really look for large addressable markets. So think about moonshots, not necessarily that it has to be a, a deep tech type of moonshot, um, but just going after big markets. So if things go well, the company should be positioned to become a very large company. You know, we 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 want things that have the chance to be a hundred to a thousand x kind of possibility. We know that realistically, they're they're not all going to get there, um, but that's the kind of ambition and and scale that that we have in mind. Um, and you know, to Adora specifically, um, we we felt that there's a, a very important market that needs to be served. I mean, this is going after um, uh, menopause and, and women in the workplace um, and is a very important issue in terms of both physical and mental health and wellness um, and is uh, something that I think has been swept under the carpet for far too long. Um, so we do see that as, as a big market. We, we like the team. Um, there was a good lead investor for us, a VC, I think, out of Spain um, that kind of led the round, um, which lent credibility for us. We, we try to move quickly. Um, and efficiently in our decision making, um, but we do look for certain signs and and knowing that a reputable VC has has been involved as well as you know obviously Angel Academy and sometimes other investors that have done their own diligence. It, it gives us confidence and conviction to move forward quickly. These are relatively small checks um, for us, um, but we 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 don't want to be careless about it. Um, but you know we're we're kind of looking for for sort of multiple indicators, and we sort of use a scorecard method to sort of check how does the team look, how does the traction look, how how does the investor set look. Um, and, and all of these sort of factors play into it. And then the kind of the, the cherry on top and, and bonus for a lot of these deals and including Adora specifically is um, an eye toward impact. Um, while our firm or funds don't have a specific mandate around impact or even a definition of impact, it's something that I think is very meaningful to a lot of us who work here, um, Brittany and myself certainly included. Um, I, I sort of published a book in recently called Higher Purpose Venture Capital, which is really about how venture capital can be used as a tool um, to um, em empower uh, founders and entrepreneurs um, to grow their businesses, to solve meaningful um, problems, um, specifically around inequality and, and sort of workplace inequality uh, is, is key among them. So um, I, I always um, 
lean in on the opportunities where it looks like there's a great business, great team, and, and is also solving um, a, a real societal problem. Yeah, very cool. I think we can buy a book on Amazon now. So I think we should Thank put you. Yes. in the chat. <laughs> Please, <laughs> appreciate it. Yes. It's Higher purpose venture capital. <laughs> Um, so like uh, once they are an AV company like Portco, uh, I think you guys have like CEO services to help. Maybe you should talk about that a bit because I think it's hugely, hugely helpful to portfolio companies. Yeah, Brittany? Yeah, happy to start. Um, so I think one of our key value adds is sort of like this giant network that we come with. So obviously we have 1,000 LPs, which is quite large and um, kind of hard to beat. Um, but I think all broader than that, we have a community of 600,000 people that is really sort of impactful and sort of making key introductions for our portfolio company. So especially as portfolio, as uh, CEOs or portcos are just sort of building or looking for key introductions to customers or potential customers or even seeking advice from people that have sort of been in their shoes before, we're really great for, I think, providing those connections um, and sort of like helping people think through the different challenges that they come across as a CEO or as a builder. I think um, we also have like a full range of offerings. I think that's just one of the most impactful ones. I think also offering office space. So as Ron mentioned, we have six offices across the US and I think for early stage companies, that's sort of hard to come by. Um, and I think that can be really helpful for founders as well. Um, we also have a really great social presence. And I think that's also been really helpful for founders looking to sort of build their brand and sort of get their brand out to a wider group of people and wider audience. Um, and I think those are all like at least the top three that I've seen from our founders that they've really enjoyed and been able to sort of leverage as they're sort of building and meeting different challenges or having different triumphs. Um, but we also do look for other ways to be helpful. We have a full range of offerings. I, I don't think I could even name them all, but um, those are definitely some of the most key aspects and key things that we bring to the table as well. We do strive to be the world's most impactful co-investor. Um, so we don't take board seats, which is one of the ways that it frees up our time to focus on on sourcing and evaluating deals. Um, so we're not always as close to, to the boardroom decisions on strategy and things like that, um, but we can be very complementary to lead investors and, and offer um, you know, some, some of these things that, that Brittany mentioned that um, you know, that not all investors have. I mean, we, we have over 600,000 people that are opted into our newsletters and follow us on social media and so forth. And there's a lot of reach there and a lot of experts we can tap into. And um, I, I think we, we tend to find that our portfolio founders are get more than they expect when when we invest and we, we kind of share with them all the, the different things that we can do. No, I think we definitely strive to have you guys on the cap tables of the deals that we're in because it's hugely, hugely helpful to anybody who's like part of that. Um, so like based on what you've been seeing and what you've been seeing from us and also maybe like other um, people in the Super Angel program, what differences have you been noticing between US and UK founders, like European founders? Yeah, I mean, in, in many ways, there there's a lot of, similarity um, in, in terms of the types of industry coverage that we see and um, the right level of ambition. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I do think that um, there might be a different approach toward um, expansion uh, in a couple of respects. One is, um, I think U.S. founders might be a little bit more confident, whether that's well-placed or not, um, in, particularly in their ability to raise money and grow into a very large company very quickly. Um, so we we have to take a little bit of a discount factor sometimes when, when just talking to ambitious founders. The closer they are to Silicon Valley, the more <laughs> ambitious we think they get about their, their valuations and how much money they can raise and how, how big they can become. Um, but that kind of comes with the territory. You also, we, we like investing in ambitious founders and, you know, we, we'd be a little bit nervous if, if they weren't, um, yeah. but we just have to kind of take that with a measure of understanding of kind of where they're coming from. Whereas, you know, some of the experience in, I think, some of the European and UK founders um, is, is maybe a little bit more measured and um, perhaps appropriate <laughs> in, in terms of what, what can be expected. Um, but uh, in terms of ideas, in terms of qualifications um, that we see, I, I would say it's very similar. And, you know, if, if we're doing more deals in the US um, than, than UK or Europe, it, it's really 
just because of of the 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 inbound and the opportunities that we see. We're just seeing more deals in the US because that's kind of where our network is and, and where we're located. Um, but we, you know, I, I could envision us getting to a point where we're doing half of our deals internationally. Um, and you know, we 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 try to to find them when we can. Um, but uh yeah, I don't know, Brittany, if you've seen any have any other observations on that. Yeah, I think the observation is less so about the founders, but more so about the market. So I think like for the example of Provenance, like there's a really favorable environmental regulatory market in the in the European space versus like the US. I think the US is starting to get there, but obviously a um, well. bit of a difference there. Um, or even like the way healthcare is set up in the UK versus the US. So I think like there's always those slight nuances, um, just in the terms of just in terms of the markets, but um, otherwise, I feel like there's a lot of overlap between the founders that we see in the U.S. and the ones in the U.K. and further abroad, too. Do you think that there is sort of like a difference between we see more founders now pitching, OK, we're going to be able to get to break even at this point, etc., versus uh, trying to pitch for growth and yeah, <laughs> the yeah I think it's all cost kind of thing? Yeah, I think there's definitely been more of an emphasis on sustainable growth and profitability a lot sooner than prior years in venture where it was like growth at all costs and we're willing to subsidize that. I think that's definitely been a difference that I've seen since starting versus like, you know, when Uber was first coming around when it was like, you know, we'll do $3 rise just to have the largest rider base. And I think investors are a bit more um, conservative in terms of the, the growth that they're willing to subsidize and also just like wanting to understand the clear pathway to profitability. Well, I mean, you did mention the climate and everything. So like, have you been seeing that US VCs versus like UK Europe, are they asking for more specific preferences in terms of, you know, terms when they're raising? Well, not when they're raising, when they're funding. Do you, do you mean like in terms of the term sheets? Like a participation, doing? like a preference, like we see 1.5x, 2, 3 participation. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't seen a, a, a major shift in that, um, to be honest, of late. Um, uh, you know, I, I think you get into these situations when um, there's uh, like, it, it's almost like a down round or it's like some kind of a distress situation or a turnaround or a pivot or something where new investors come in and, and kind of try to show their strength a bit. But I, I don't think that's always viewed especially favorably in our industry. I mean, we we kind yeah. of, we as investors need to get along with each other. And sometimes we're going to be on the different side of the coin uh, as an insider. And, you know, if, if you get, you know, pushed down to common or, you know, th there, there are a lot of tools that are available for, you know, later stage investors to kind of push down earlier investors. Um, but that has quite negative consequences, both in the short and long term. Um, mm -hmm. And I think is, is kind of, um, in all honesty, a kind of a worst case scenario. So we don't see a lot of that. I mean, we consider every investment individually as it is. Um, but, um, you know, hopefully most investors understand that, you know, we, we need investors at all stages if we're going to build strong companies. And and if early investors feel that they're just going to get pushed down every time, then, then they're not going to be there in the future. So. Well, okay. So like, I, I think basically you choose who you want to play with and you should choose the people that will play in the future rounds with you. And like, why would you? Yeah. yeah. You... <laughs> <laughs> um, so maybe let's talk a little bit about like trends and bright spots um, with the new funds, etc. What are you guys seeing that you're really bullish about in the next few years? Yeah, well, I mean, everything has become an AI deal today. Uh, you know, <laughs> companies that you know never were a year or two ago suddenly are. Um, but so then there's a little bit of sorting through what what's actually yeah. AI versus just like an an augmentation or something. Um, but you know, we, we, there are always certain trends. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, you know, very heavy fintech, I would say, in what we were seeing. Um, now I feel like I'm seeing a lot more health tech. I mean, certainly digital health. Um, but but even in in the you know kind of the therapeutics and and other areas um, is, is is kind of a trend. But these are kind of natural evolutions of markets and um, trying to figure out where things are um, standing, where the interest is. Also, the public markets is are usually a kind of an early indication of where venture dollars will go. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. the last couple of years have been a bit challenging with 
with very few IPOs and, and you know, the M&A market's been pretty dry. We're starting to see some early signs of recovery there, um, yep. but but there, there's a kind of a market disconnect where, where public markets are super frothy and yet companies are not willing to go public. So I don't really understand that at this point. Um, I think as investors, I, I, I still see a lot of value in the market. Valuations are certainly well down from their highs um, of kind of 2021. Um, and to me, any value investor would say, well, well, now's the time to get in rather than kind of still running for the hills. So a lot of dry powder, um, you know, untapped capital that that bigger funds are sitting on um, that I think really should start getting put to work or or LPs are going to be like, you know, what are you doing here? Yeah. Um, so um, I'm, 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 you know, cautiously optimistic that this year is, is going to bring about um, some, um, some, you know, positive evolution. And, and if, if there's more sort of exit activity, that will lead to more, more venture activity at the earlier stages too. Yeah, that's what we're hoping to see also here, but I think it might, it might take a little while. Yeah, I think the somehow the U.S. is maybe a little bit ahead of of, of mm. other countries, um, but um, they'll they'll eventually be you know fairly correlated. I think it's there's just you know short term volatility, I guess. But yeah, yeah, and I would echo all of Ron's points. I think um, I definitely seen have seen a, quite a few like down or flat rounds, especially for companies that raised in 2021 and are now going back out to market for their next raise. I would say the only exception is for AI deals. I feel like those have had really high valuations, um, astronomically high, some, would, yeah. some, some could even say. So I think it sort of depends on where the energy is. And for sure, it's all around AI right now. So definitely seeing a lot in that space. Um, but to Ron's point, definitely have quite a bit to sort through in terms of what's a, a real novel application and what's sort of just a, a nice slide. <laughs> like in, in terms of the AI, DD, is there a way that you are specifically trying to sort it out? Like how do you do the filtering? Because like that's something I think a lot of investors at the moment are sort of trying to struggle because like you say, every single pitch deck we see now has Gen AI in it. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of it is just how it's being applied. Like, is it just sort of like a note taker assistant? I think I've seen a lot of like like workflow productivity yeah. and AI tools. And I think for those like, well, great, very competitive space. So I think just understanding if there's a real novel application that is actually going to be different than, you know, someone just using chat GPT versus something that could like maybe make AI run faster. So I think like chips mm -hmm. is something that's like really um, been integral and really exciting in terms of a space because they sort of like power a lot of the gen AI applications to even run versus someone doing like, you know, a note powered AI assistant taker. <laughs> yeah, we do see a lot of companies that were an AI company before it was kind of in the lingo of, of, of yeah. grandmother, right? So um, now every everyone kind of knows something about AI or chat GPT or something, but but there were AI companies around, I mean, for, yep. for decades. And, you know, some of the companies, uh, um, you know, like we have one that we invested in called Lincode, which is AI and quality inspection and heavy manufacturing. I mean, they've been around right. since you know, several years and already well into the market. And um, so you you can sort of separate uh, a bit uh, out um, those that that have like a real application versus those that are just, you know, using kind of buzzwords. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we have some audience questions. Uh, also, uh, just a note, Brittany is booked and busy today. And uh, <laughs> In a few minutes, she also has to drop off slightly earlier to help with another webinar that she's running for the Women's Fund. Uh, so if you have Brittany specific questions, uh, definitely put them in chat now. Um, so yeah, from Laura, is there one company that's particularly impressed you and why? I, I Yeah, so I, I've invested in a lot of companies at this <laughs> point, uh, five years into this being at the most active VC firm. So there's like dozens and dozens of them at least. Um, but one that I like to cite as an example, and it's one that I include in, in the book is an education tech company called All Here um, that was started by a former Boston inner city public school teacher um, who really saw the problem that student absenteeism was having. Um, and she wanted to apply technology to try and fix this. So she created, an, speaking of AI, an, an AI chatbot, but several years ago, um, that would help uh, schools communicate with students and families. Um, so, for example, um, if, if the school notices that a student's absent, communicating with the parent, say, hey, I noticed 
your child is not here today. Can we help you with anything? And if they write back something like, well, um, you know, our car broke down. I had no way of getting my child to school. And they can write back, oh, we can actually help you with that. Um, maybe we, we can provide transportation to get your child to school. Um, and this company is not only, obviously, that's amazing impact, um, but this is being being adopted across the country now. Um, so there's, you know, this is really having um, a, a serious um, effect on on bringing down recidivism, or sorry, recidivism, um, school absenteeism. Sorry, that's another issue that I talk about um, <laughs> different companies, um, but um, uh, student absenteeism, um, but the company is actually, as a business, is doing really well. It's growing ARR phenomenally well, um, so it's really interesting as both a business as well as a company that's having um, impact on, on education, and, um, you know, of, of all the companies I've invested in, you know, there are many that are, are having great, you know, um, performance in different ways, but but I think this one is is a real illustration of how uh, venture back companies can can solve big problems while also becoming big businesses. That's really that's that sounds really really cool. I feel like I don't know if it is because maybe it is, but like it feels like travel tech <laughs> in a way, but also logistics and um yeah, I really like the way the impact is going. Uh, sorry, I'm just reading the questions. Uh, from Grishma, what are the benefits of being VC back versus angel or not raising any investment at all, I suppose? Yeah, I can take that. So I think um, yeah. there's a couple of things. So I think venture dollars just end up being a little bit larger than just if you do angel money. I think angel money is really good for when you're in your earliest stages. But I think as you're approaching, you know, series A, series B, series C, you really need a bit of a deeper pocket unless your angel is, you know, Richard Branson or something. And then maybe you don't need venture dollars. Um, so I think like venture dollars allow you to kind of scale a lot faster and also just get a broader capital intake so you can sort of meet a lot of your goals a lot faster. Um, I think angel money is really great for, again, early stage companies. And then I think the other opposite of that is uh, bootstrapping, which I think is quite similar to the angel conversation. Um, that's not always available to everyone. I think that's the first thing to call out. And I think similar to the angel piece, like just smaller dollars that you are able to play with um, versus if you take venture. That being said, the trade-off then is, you know, how much you own of the company. If I use my own money, I own 100% versus if I go to the venture route, I'm going to get diluted for sure. Um, so I think it just sort of depends on the business where you kind of see it going, which kind of avenue for financing makes the most sense. Yeah, that's a really good reply. I feel like that definitely like crystallizes everything that we think about in terms of like angel versus bootstrapping versus like the VC route. Um, how should founders approach you for investment? I feel like that isn't a direct route because you are co-investors, but correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. No, I, I, oh, sorry, go ahead, Brittany. No, I was going to say we are co-investors. So I think there's I think there's a couple of different ways. And I think Ron mentioned that we source in several different ways. I mean, I've had people cold outreach to me and like, I definitely have flipped through their deck and if I think it looks interesting. I'm happy to reply. So I feel like, you know, there's always the cold outreach, but I think leveraging your network is also really important. Like I've had friends that have said, you know, my friend has a startup and saw that we were connected. Can I connect you to? And I think that's also been really helpful. So I think not being afraid to just sort of reach out, but also like leveraging your network as well and seeing if they're sort of like a warm introduction. I think those are always super helpful and much more successful than generally the cold outreach. <laughs> yeah, warm intros are always appreciated um, and and more effective. I mean, we, we get inundated with with cold inbound and, and just don't have the capacity to sort through everything in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. But if there's a warm intro, that's always the founder's best bet. And sometimes that means going through LinkedIn, spending a little more time trying to figure out how to get that warm intro. But I think that's really time well spent if you're serious about connecting with that investor. If you're unable to do that, I would say the next bet, best bet is to write a really nice tailored customized email. Not, not long, I mean, just a few sentences, but make sure that it's bespoke to the person you're reaching like, hey, I noticed you invest in this company or I noticed something about your background that I find interesting just to personalize it a little bit. Um, and, and yeah, just, just make it, you know, known that you're not just kind of spamming the world, um, because, you know, VCs are, get so much inbound that we need to sort through stuff somehow. Um, so that would be my advice. Um, generally because we are co-investors, um, we'll, we'll really only dive in once there is a term sheet or, um, kind of term set through 
perhaps an anchor investor. Um, we won't invest without that. We don't negotiate terms. Um, yeah. So um, ideally for us, um, we kind of like to hear um, what once you have those terms figured out and who else is kind of in the round. Uh, but our, our commitment then is that we'll move quickly um, because we know we're coming in later in the round. Um, yeah. And we don't want to hold things up. So um, we, we sometimes get through a whole due diligence with maybe not more than even one or two calls with a team and a review of information. Um, so we can move very quickly um, if we need to. Cool. Um, I really like that. Um, I know now we've spoken a lot about all the things that you look for in terms of signals. So what are some like negative signals? What are some red flags? Yeah, I mean, I like to make sure that there's real founder market fit. Um, sometimes see startups, particularly, you know, I don't begrudge a young person right out of school or still in school who wants to do a startup. Um, I, I get that. I was a young kind of entrepreneur myself. Um, but, you know, I need to know that you don't have just have a good idea, but that you're capable of building a big business and doing it over many years and have the resilience and fortitude to do that. Um, and, if, if, if we invest in someone very young, I mean, the, the Mark Zuckerberg kind of dropout, what, these are the exceptions. This is not like the, the rule. Like I, I, in general, would rather see someone who's experienced, who has really deep domain knowledge or mm -hmm. has built a, another company successfully or been part of startups and understands what they're getting themselves into and 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 has kind of been on the, the business creation side. So, you know, I, I think just looking for, you know, the team backgrounds and, and making sure that there's some something to indicate that they're capable of, of building a successful company is, is very important um, to me. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, team is kind of number one at, when you're an early stage investor. Um, yeah. So that, that's kind of the first thing I look for. <laughs> Another question about Gen AI. Is Gen AI here to stay or is it this year's marketing uh, must do? I mean, it's definitely here to stay. I mean, you 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 can see the way it's already transforming yeah. you know, people's lives. People are writing papers with it and publishing, and um, it's it's a it's it's a hack in a way to, you know, get work done awfully quickly in in different respects. Um, so the the question is, how far is it going to go? Um, you know, there's there's a lot of you know a lot of concern and speculation about um, you know ways that it might take people's jobs and livelihoods and yeah. and and also lead to creation of fake news, fake content, all of that kind of stuff. Um, but um, yeah, um, I, one way or another, it's, it's here to stay. <laughs> AI literacy, I think, is going to be the next big thing because uh, we, we're going to need to know how to parse things. Um, yeah, how sure. will adoption of AI play out over the long term? Big question. Yeah. Yeah, well, in, in in many ways, I mean, right? It, it's gonna. It, I think it's gonna move also from kind of the the digital into the the physical world as as it intertwines with robotics and Internet of Things, and um, you know, there, there's going to be many applications. And I mean, hopefully, we as investors focus on on the good use of AI, like early cancer detection, screening of diseases. Like these are like this is like best case scenario of how AI can be applied. Um, for for the benefit of the world um, in, in in you know the healthcare world and so forth, um, but it can also be used for 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 evil. Um, there's no question uh, that you know falling into the wrong hands, AI can be applied in 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 ways that you know creating you know bots that create fake content and start infiltrating the way people think and. Um, and take over people's lives. It, it's 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 pretty scary, and we have to be very conscious of of AI's power um, because it, it's going to move forward in ways that we we can't even anticipate today. Um, but hopefully, at least my job as an investor is to at least try to be on the right side of of AI to the extent that we can make these determinations. Yeah, I think we are definitely um, in speculative fiction territory. I would say. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Chrisula has a question about how much of a founder's company should remain as their company, I guess, in terms of the stake of the company and how that might work across future rounds. Yeah, so there, there's really no right answer for that. Um, it, it's always a, it's all, this is always the classic trade-off and, and it, it's, it's worth always thinking that through at, at every stage of investment, how much you're ready to give up because, 
you know, if, if you're diluting, but you're going to be able to create a much more valuable company, you know, then it's it's worth selling shares. I mean, there was, at, you know, one time where I owned basically a third of Travel Perk, the company that I co-founded, um, and that's now in theory worth over a billion dollars today. However, the company would not be worth over a billion dollars today had I not diluted by taking money from investors, right? Even even early on. Um, so so there's no one magic formula to what what the percentage is. I, I would say um, it's also important for an investor to recognize that over dilution is not good for them either because they want the founders to have that upside. Founders are going to work really, really hard with their blood, sweat, and tears, hopefully for years um, mm. to build a great company. There needs to be a pot of gold at the end of that. I mean, you know, I mean, the reward of creating a valuable company and all that, yes, but financial reward too, because that that's that's what Definitely. we're here for. And, um, you know, th there should be the prospect of becoming fabulously wealthy if things go well, because it's going to be, you know, a lot of pain in the process. It's not easy for most people oh. to, to build a company. There's so many challenges um, around, you know, hiring and uh, sometimes firing and customers and product not working as intended. And, you know, there's a lot of bumps along the road. It's not a straight path. Um, to have the the fortitude to to get from you know zero to one or A to B whatever you call it, um, you know it it takes a lot and so there there should be a good incentive plan in place and so if you're a founder I would think about you know not diluting beyond the point that you you feel that it's um, that you're going to start losing people, yeah. that incentive. So. Well, I think valuations is always a tricky one, particularly now. So like. What are the ranges that you're seeing uh, at the seed stage? Um, is there a difference? Like geographically, uh, what we're seeing in the UK, I feel like has dropped maybe 25% since like pre, mm -hmm. um, yeah. GFT. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I would see 25 or sometimes even more percent yeah. um, versus what, what we would have been seeing probably two years ago. Um, so I invest at pre-seed and seed. I've, I've invested the, the lowest valuation I've invested at has basically been a million um, into like a just idea stage, but we like the idea and we like the founder and like, okay, it's a million, you know, it's right. pretty, pretty low, but we, we've also seen pre or, or seed deals that are getting up into kind of the 25, $30 million range. Um, but they're kind of late seed with traction with customers or with significant product development. Um, but, but yes, indeed it, it has come down. I mean, th this has been, a, I think a healthy reset in many ways. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, certainly in later stages as well, uh, companies that might have been worth a billion might be worth even a fraction of that now, just as investors. Oh, take we <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's just kind of the reality. But yeah, there's been there's definitely been some reset happening. OK, and then like a final question, I think in reverse, when does it become a red flag? So like, what's the point of like disincentivizing? Oh, so like at, you, you mean in terms of valuation or when does... I think in terms of the founder stakes, we jump back a little bit. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, that that's kind of personal. Everyone's going to have a different baseline on what's meaningful for them in, in terms of, um, you know, how much they hang on to. I, I would say the more you can hang on to, the better, I, you know, it's... You, we see deals that are that are immediately oversubscribed, where um, the founder has all the leverage and and should frankly use that if if they have it, um, and and other cases where it's really a fight to fill around and um, you may have to reset. So I think it's important to keep a pulse of the market. You know, it everyone's going to be different in terms of what what's what's a meaningful incentive for you or versus you know someone else if they've been through it a few times have already had some big exits mm -hmm. they're gonna have a different perspective from a first time founder who, who's never had a big payday for example um but um that, that's why I'm, I'm I'm hesitant to give out any specific numbers but um yeah you you really just have to evaluate and and but don't necessarily evaluate on your own and this is what advisors are for it's always important yeah. from from day one to have good advisors and and I would recommend if you're looking for that first one or two advisors, Think about founders who are broadly in your industry, who've created a company that's at a stage um, or either exited or at a stage where you would hope to be in probably five to 10 years. Um, that's a great kind of advisor because they've been down the road and they're going to see some of the things coming that, that you may not have seen before. Um, and that that's, you know, work, worked for me uh, and, and companies that I've seen. Yeah, hugely. You learn from their mistakes, as it were, and their experiences. 
Absolutely. Disincentivize and valuations. Like, uh, is there a point where a valuation downturn also becomes a red flag? So like, I suppose you wouldn't invest or co-invest if there are too many down rounds, if there are too many flat valuations. But it, it's always a risk. I mean, we, we, we prefer to invest into strong momentum. <laughs> Yeah, um, there are occasionally pivots though that make sense and recaps and situations where like we understand you had a product it didn't work but you've discovered something new and you need to kind of go back to the market and reset. Um, so we don't love that, but it 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 sometimes happens and we try to consider those on a case by case basis because sometimes it's justified and not every down round is necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes it leads to creating a more valuable company in the long run because you can raise more money and and you've refined your strategy and so forth. But um, yeah, we'll we'll look at all of those on a case by case basis. Very fair. Well, um, finally, I suppose, do you have any advice for our founders and any female founders out there who are pitching to us, uh, building deals with us, and uh, eventually hoping to pitch to you? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, we, we do a lot of investing in female founders. I, I looked at, I was doing some analysis actually recently on our, um, um, the investments that we'd made into, you know, digital health in the last couple of years. And actually the majority of them were female-led companies. Amazing. So, you know, I, I, um, I, I would, I would try to, you know, lean into being a female founder. I, I do honestly believe that there are investors that are trying to do better in terms of the diversification of their founding team that recognize some of the statistics around the benefits of having female founders and, um, you know, well, well balanced founding teams. Um, use it to your advantage um, as much as possible. Um, and, uh, you know, I would say that, you know, if if you're ready for investment from VC, you know. Come, come talk to us um, and, and talk to you. And um, there, there are a lot of great funds out there. There are probably a lot of even female founded or focused venture and angel funds that you may not even know of. Just keep networking. It's important to keep talking to investors. Don't be afraid to share your ideas. People, I, I think, are, get a little bit too nervous around well, someone's going to steal their idea or not. It's it's ultimately about execution exactly. <laughs> as much or more than the idea. Um, keep sharing what you're doing because that leads to introductions and, and other conversations and just, you know, every every day, just, just keep on, keep on selling what you're doing and, um, you know, eventually you, you'll get there. Sage advice, Ron, sage advice. Um, great. Thank you very much for that. And then uh, I'm going to hand it back to Sarah to wrap it up for us. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. And thank you, Brittany. I know she's had to rush away, but please thank her on our behalf, Ron. Um, and thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. Just very quickly before you go, um, Michelle is going to be putting some links um, into chat, um, some links for alumni ventures, um, including the name of Ron's book, um, which you can find on Amazon. Um, and also, uh, if you haven't yet applied to pitch to Angel Me and you're a founder looking for investment, um, please do so. Um, that's via our website. Um, if you'd like to join us as an angel investor, um, please contact Michelle at Angel Academy and also some links to our social media including our youtube channel where you will find the recording of this webinar as well as others that we've done uh, and we have a few events coming up our may webinar will be looking at the investment environment from consumer tech with our partners at dc advisory um, and in June, we'll be talking about how to do due diligence on early stage investments. Um, that's important for both investors to understand, of course, but also founders, what that process is likely to look like for them. Um, I hope you'll be able to join us again um, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Many thanks again for joining us. Bye.